Hi, this is actually so strange that I'm actually calling and leaving this message, but I actually just listened to a podcast of yours, and it touched me, and I kind of wanted to reach out and see if you have any more information on something that you touched on briefly, and if maybe you could direct me in that area. I'm referring to the podcast you did with Alex Edelman. I actually just listened to it. I've been going through some of your podcasts, and they're excellent. I'm really enjoying them. At the very end, you touched on something, and you were talking about the Megillah of Purim and how the tune of Echa comes in, and you use it as this marshal to these close friends, and one of them is moving on and getting married, and how the other person is feeling, and, you know, I understood how you connected, you know, in that podcast, but what I'm getting at is, is there more information about that actual real topic, about what happens to these, especially, you know, in, in the generation we're in where there's so many older singles and there's a crisis in the Shizuchim, and this obviously is going to happen. There's going to be a point where these close friends who have been leaning on each other for so many years have been almost like each other's person until they've found their real person, and then that first one finally gets their moment, their Purim, and has their wedding. Is there information out there, advice out there for both people? How to go through that process in the best possible way for for both? It's it's, it's hard for both sides. Uniquely, I think even more for the the one that's left behind, you know, so to speak. How can they a celebrate the other person's simcha while having that pain of losing their person? And how do they keep their their head up and hope that Purim is coming to them? And also, how can the one who is getting married maybe be more sensitive? Even though it's their time to be happy, how can they tap into the pain that maybe their friend is going through? It's a very complicated thing to navigate. And I'm wondering, do you have you heard other speeches about such a topic? Is that a topic that you would ever address on a podcast? So what this listener is referring to is an analogy, and the Hebrew word for analogy is mushal. That's what she kept on mentioning, a mushal. As an analogy I used at the end of the pre-Purim Alex Edelman podcast where the Part of the Megillah, we use the trup, the tune from the Megillah of Lamentations of Echa, and we sing it sadly. And what I imagined this as was two friends uh, who were, you know, dating together and, you know, going on that journey together. And one of them gets married first, and the other one, you know, is is sitting kind of alone at that first friend's wedding by themselves, uh, an experience that I have had many, many times as that lone person. Uh, I remember that, which is why the imagery uh, worked for me uh, and, and something that I, I always mention and think about in the Megillah. And that friend in the middle of the circle brings in that other friend into their simcha and dances with them and says, you know, your story, too, is a Purim that has not yet unfolded. And this is what we're doing in the Megillah, where we're kind of bringing in Echa, this story of exile, into the Purim story and dancing together and saying that Lamentations, the story of the destruction of the Temple, the story of exile, is is also a Purim story that has not yet fully unfolded. It's an idea that it doesn't appear explicitly in any text. It's imagery that really I was drawing upon my own experience. If you want to find a text that talks about it in a close way, the notion of bringing other people into the circle who are struggling, this is something that Rebbe Nachman actually talks about in Likute Maharan uh, in Tinyana, which is the second section of that work in the 23rd Torah. It's in Hebrew, but you can find many, many translations. And he says that there and the notion, just even highlighting the notion that it's so strange that we use the trup, the tune for Eicha within the Megillah, something that many people notice. And uh, Rev Hutner in his work, Pachar Yitzchak, on Purim, also makes note of this. And I guess maybe if you multiply that Rev Hutner with the Rebbe Nachman, you get pretty close to the idea that we mentioned, the imagery. But in terms of the idea itself, I haven't heard a great deal of people speak about it. I am not surprised at all that people struggle with this and the fact that the caller reached out to hear more about it uh, is actually not so surprising because it was a Torah idea that emerged from a very personal experience. Uh, I had very, very close friends who we were in the the struggle together. We'd come back, uh, you know, talk about dating life and share our frustrations together and over and over again, those friends got uh, got married uh, before me and I would have to be at their weddings. I, I had a roommate. I remember at his his wedding, I, I had to 
leave in the middle and I just sat alone in my car. I, I couldn't be there. It was really, it was hard. It was hard to feel engaged. And, you know, other weddings, you would just kind of like party really hard and drown out your own sorrows. But learning how to engage in somebody else's joy while you are going through something, particularly something that relates to the very joy of the celebration you are participating in, is extraordinarily painful and difficult. Nobody would expect somebody who just got laid off to have a joyous time at celebrating their friend's kiddish, celebrating their promotion at work and making partner. We sometimes don't give ourselves enough credit for how difficult that could be. In terms of navigating that with a friendship, number one, yes, undoubtedly one of the topics that sit most high on my agenda to really talk about is, you know, you could call it shiduchim. I'm, I'm probably not going to use that term. I think it's, it's romantic relationships. I think it's finding that process of both finding, preserving, cultivating marriage, dating, romance in your life is something that obviously looms large in my own story. I was a big part of my own doubt that I had in my 20s of being able to commit to that and is a topic we absolutely need to address. But in terms of people who are going through it now, and hopefully we'll address it more expansively later, the only thing that I would say is you, you have to have realistic expectations on yourself. I don't think we can ever legislate to others how perfectly to treat their friends. I think that there are different people who get hurt and feel sensitivities and feel pain in, in different ways. And people need to adjust their expectations in multiple ways. Number one, realizing that there are things that are going to hurt us that are not meant maliciously. That's number one. Number two, adjust your expectation of who your friends are. Uh, this might be a difficult thing to say. Not everyone you went to high school, seminary, yeshiva, wherever it was, not everyone is your best friend. And sometimes it is through the cauldron of this process that you realize that you don't have 70 friends. You have uh, three friends. You have four friends who you can be real with, who you can be honest with. And some of those friends might be at different stages in life than you. But a real friendship is something that you can be deeply honest and authentic with. And imposing that standard of friendship on every acquaintance that you've met or every friend, and I'm using air quotes for that, is unrealistic and unfair to yourself. And for those who you know, they were in your orbit, you were friends in 11th grade, you were roommates in yeshiva or seminary, and now it feels different. Maybe it is different. And, and allowing yourself to acknowledge that. And dare I say move on in a healthy way, but but not holding every single friendship so tightly uh, is actually, I think, can be something healthy. Finally, I, I think the most important thing with this is making sure that you and your life are not diminished to this one situation, this one area that is lacking in your life. And it's that final point of advice that I would give to the friend who has moved on, so to speak, the Purim story that has completely unfolded, that when you talk to people who are yet unfolding, you have to find things to talk about other than how's dating going, how's this one area of your life that you are struggling with. Uh, a friendship should not be diminished to one area of struggle. Dare I say that it was somewhat suspect on the quality of the friendship itself. If the only thing that you're bonding over is dating, uh, that's obviously something that unites you. It could be something that deepens the friendship, but it has to be more than that. And when you reach out to friends, you need to make sure that you are not diminishing them. You have to give them the space to allow them to talk about it, but that's, of course, their choice.